is going to be a double act, so um, we're probably a bit, little bit like um, the uh, money Corbis or money Barker. Yeah. Um, I'll let you decide which one's which. I'd like to see it more as a fully integrated <laughs> delivery partner and client presentation. But <laughs> She's very slick, is Kat. <laughs> So you've, um, you've heard how um, through the commercial processes and strategies we adopted and the project controls that we ran, we uh, drove delivery. Jason and I are going to talk about some of the other aspects of our processes and policies and what we did on the ground that really helped um, deliver our program of construction. We grouped our, I think all of our processes and um, initiatives could be grouped under sort of five main strategies that we used. And the first one was all concerning people and delivery skills probably the most important strategy of all of all of those we adopted. And um, we've talked earlier about we knew we needed a delivery partner and we appointed one quickly after the ODA was formed. We made a very conscious decision that what we needed, what we wanted was a partner and not a program manager, not a sort of a dumb program manager, but an intelligent delivery partner who was an equal partner, sat at the table with us, um, challenged our decisions, helped uh, build our strategy, helped force the pace because of the way they were incentivized. It was very much in their interests to keep coming back to us saying, we're going to deliver this, we, we need a decision now. So we had some fairly difficult discussions. Um, CLM's um, program director sat in our, in our executive board uh, meetings and you know, it was not at all uncommon that they would challenge us. Um, they particularly challenged us um, with some of our um, speed of decision making with LOCOG. As we said, they weren't perhaps as mature a, a customer as um, we would have liked. And so CLM would be frequently coming to us saying, you really need to make this happen with LOCOG. You really need to tell them this is how it's going to be. So um, that was the, the aspect of, of our partner and not just a, a program manager. As the ODA, um, we... We tried to be an intelligent client. We couldn't call ourselves a thin client because at um, something over 250 people at our peak, we had enough people there to provide the assurance that we needed, given that we had a delivery partner and a, a large supply chain. Um, we had you know, a substantial number of people in the ODA as well. But we recognized our role was one of stakeholder management and assurance and allowing the delivery partner to deliver. Because we went through the full project life cycle from uh, initiation to project closeout in about six years, we recognised that both our organisation structure and the governance that sat alongside that was going to need to change frequently as the programme went through its life cycle. So we made a, a very conscious decision at least once a year. We looked formally at our governance structures and our organisations and we made sure they changed to keep up with the phase of the programme that we were in. CLM had a full-time uh, organisational development specialist working with them who constantly looked at their organisation and one of the things that they brought to the, um, the table for us was the ability to, to move key staff in and out as, as to match the skills and requirements of the stage of the programme. They could bring in new people and, and retire other people back to the parent body organisations. And finally, as you've heard all about, of course, uh, procurement of high-quality contractors with delivery expertise was really important to us. And we set a lot of store around our, our governance and our monthly cadence of data and reviews and decision-making, the heartbeat of the programme. And again, nothing um, new or startling here really about um, the governance structure. As I said, it changed through the, the uh, passage of time, but this was the typical one probably in midstream. Um, the ODA's Executive Management Board was the, um, the centre of the decision-making for decisions that needed to be escalated to that level. And as well as um, strategy policy approvals, um, business case approvals. It also had a monthly review of um, performance where CLM program director would bring in um, the analysis of the performance, we'd look at the, um, the good things that had happened that month, those things that had happened to time, but then spend most of the time talking about issues, um, decisions required and so on. Um, that board was supported by a number of other monthly boards and um, the change board we've talked about already, the procurement board and commercial board that's, that have been covered and very fundamentally in terms of our progress health check tracking meeting, the implementation reviews which CLM led, two-day review, total health of the program every month, bit of a spiky chair review when the project manager came in and had to um, you know, answer for all of the, the progress or lack of progress on, on their projects. Uh, as well as to ensure that the priority themes got um, sufficient focus because if anything 
was likely to be dropped in terms of importance that could have been some of those priority theme targets. We actually had board board level, as in ODA board level, performance boards for each of the priority themes. So we had a sustainability board that was chaired actually by the um, chairman of the ODA, which looked um, every quarter at performance against the priority themes and any help needed. CLM course ran its own governance to manage um, the programme. I've already talked about the implementation review, which was at the heart of it. And some of the uh, monthly meetings that, that fed that, very critically, a, a monthly review for every project of um, cost, trends and risk. Integration meetings to look at the critical paths, the milestones, the interfaces between the projects where we'd grind through, or CLM would grind through the, the detail of all the integration issues. As ODA as client um, would be invited to sit in on these meetings and participate, but we would not swarm in with a load of people. These were the delivery partners meetings to run the project in the way that they saw fit. So I would participate in the implementation reviews as an ODA representative, but we did not attempt to sort of take over or uh, advise in that way. And Jason, I think probably if you said something about Shelt. Yeah, I'll pick up um, health and safety in Shelt um, when we come to the next couple of slides, and I'll also answer the question you raised earlier about um, the health and safety environment, and I'll also try and pick up your point about industrial relations. So um, a number of people have asked us about ODA as a client and um, what made us a successful client, if, if indeed that is, that is how we are regarded. And I think we had um, one major thing to our advantage here that was rather unique in that because we were a startup organisation, um, we were able to build both the culture and the organisation from scratch. So there was no baggage, there was no organisational politics. It was one of the things I found most different well, having come from a major multinational company and into into this we were able to hire people with proven delivery capabilities so we I guess had a very hand-picked organization we tried to set ourselves up as a, an intelligent client as I've said we had a clear view of our role which was that we were the overall leaders of the program and we would we should be held to account for its successful delivery but we were the sponsors we'd chosen to exercise our responsibility through the delivery partner and one of our key roles was shielding the delivery partner from external interference. As we said earlier, there were all sorts of assurance bodies and other interested parties who wanted to know what was going on. Um, as far as possible, we as the ODA attempted to, to deal with those groups and allow CLM to get out with the Tier 1 contractors on the site and actually deliver the job. We were... Um, successful in um, building and maintaining a very positive relationship with our sponsoring department in government and um, for all the, of you who worked on public sector projects before you'll realise this is very important um, government do of course want to know what's going on, they had their own assurance function that was set up specifically for the Olympics, the government Olympic executive and they could have made our life very difficult frankly, um, they could have been overly intrusive, um, overly bureaucratic but we built that relationship successfully, we worked alongside them we tried to make sure our insurance met their needs and so again try to shield the program from from um, more more assurance they may otherwise have had it's easy to say because we had such an overriding uh, mission and, and everyone was behind it but we did have um, absolute focus and um, we were very aligned on the priorities within the ODA and with the delivery partner and I'll come back to this later, but this whole thing about transparency and scrutiny and recognising it as legitimate, I think we as a client recognised that early on and we attempted to use that to our advantage. Our second strategy was one of collaboration and alignment, and this is relevant across various aspects of the programme. The first one was in terms of the physicals, if you like, of the projects, keeping the targets for every project in balance and aligned at all times throughout the, the life of the programme. We said at the start we had the programme baseline report that gave us a, an initial cut of all of the projects and the programme in total, where we knew we had cost, scope, schedule and the priority theme targets um, in, in balance. We could They were deliverable to the best of our knowledge at that time. As the programme went on and changes, of course, did happen, um, we realised that we could not shoehorn more scope in. If more scope had arrived, we could not shoehorn more scope in without something else changing. So we didn't attempt to say to projects, well, you'll just have to swallow that. Um, you'll just have to do more in a shorter time. You'll just have to find a, a cost offset somewhere. Don't tell us about it. We made you know, conscious decisions of if we are required to take on this scope, then this is the consequence. Is this consequence manageable or not? If it is, we'll consider doing it. So, um, you know, we, in an ideal world, we're all 
like to freeze our scope very early on. We weren't successful in defining the scope perfectly from day one, as no project is, um, but we did make sure we kept our targets in balance uh, throughout the life of the project. We already talked a lot about using NEC3, so I won't talk about that again, but that was part of our strategy of a, a collaborative approach with um, our suppliers. In terms of aligning the whole workforce behind the, the, the goals of the project, I guess we had it easy compared to most projects. We had the, you know, the, the, the Olympic Games was what everyone um, was, well, was there to work on. They all recognised that. Um, and it's amazing, we un unashamedly used that with the, our employees, with the contractors, to you know, build a groundswell of, of willingness and, and desire to work on the project. Things like this pin badge that I'm wearing here, there's many different ver versions of that. We use, we use these um, with the workforce, with the contractors. It's amazing what you can get people to do for a mug or a pin badge, frankly, so, or a free breakfast. Uh, so we, do, we did have some definite advantages there that, that would be ha harder to create on other projects. You'd have to sort of artificially create some of those things. Building the partnership, both within CLM and between the ODA and CLM, was crucially important. And you'll see the six of us here today, and hopefully we look like quite a joined-up team, having worked together for five or six years. But it wasn't necessarily always like that. When I joined the project early in 2007, and CLM, who'd come together you know, specifically for the bid, had not worked together, the three companies had not worked together before, um, I could very clearly see the joins. I could tell when I was speaking to someone which of the three um, parent companies they worked for, and they didn't really act as one company. So they did a lot of work you know, very conscious work, a, a, a specifically defined task to make them work together better as an organisation. I think very successfully, because certainly by the time we got to sort of mid-phase of the programme, you could no longer see the joins. You didn't know who worked for who, and they were a much co more cohesive team. Um, but also between the ODA and CLM, we also had our own work to do. Obviously, CLM had their own commercial objectives. They also, I genuinely believe, had a very strong desire emotionally to succeed, as we, as we did. So again, we had some advantages there. But um, we did a whole number of things to try and build the team between the ODA and CLM um, from the executive level, level downwards. As I said, the CLM delivery director attended the um, executive management board meetings, the ODA management board meetings. Um, most of our staff were co-located, particularly in the early days. We were all co-located in a building in Canary Wharf. That was very important for forming the relationships early on. As the projects moved into the construction phase out on site, we made a conscious decision at that time that it was less um, necessary that the team should be co-located because the relationships had been, had been built. And also it helped us reinforce the different roles between the ODA as a stakeholder manager and CLM as the delivery partner if we sort of separated the teams at that time. So, so we did that. Um, but I think we're able to maintain the relationships that we'd formed in, in the early stages. And we did the usual kind of things, joint executive team dinners, team building events and um, we ran a couple of all team team build events up here in the Lake District in fact where the ODA and CLM teams um, worked together and they were seen as very successfully and uh, the ODA as client sat in on most of the um, CLM delivery meetings. This all sounds like it's been really easy and we've had an easy time with CLM and the ODA so um, let, me, let me cast your minds back to around about 2005 and in, in that respect the economy was booming Construction inflation was running out of control. You just had projects like T5 finished, so there was big expectations from the trade unions. You'd also had projects like um, Wembley finished, and there was lots of expectations from the Tier 1 supply chain that they didn't want to do anything like Wembley's. So, least of all, they didn't want to come and work at the Olympics. And also, you had the workforce. We had a choice. We were in a position where most people entering construction could just go to where they were getting paid the most money. So, we didn't have the best environment for when we entered into and the Olympic delivery um, side of the programme. So we did have to work very hard with the Tier 1s, the unions, and also the actual workers who came to site. So let me start with the Tier 1s. And this is some of the things we had to do in terms of our delivery strategy. Straight away, we had to start off by some interventions. Just putting it out to normal OG notice was not going to get the response we needed. And a good example of that was we had to actually go knocking on chief executive doors saying, please will you bid for this particular project. A case in point was the aquatic centre. You know, we had to go, not begging, but we had to persuade Ian Tyler, the chief executive of Alphabeta, that we would like him to bid for that project. And if you look at the stadium, we only had one bidder. So, you know, it wasn't a great position to start with. So, in many ways, the tier ones had the upper hand because they held a number of the cards. And least of all then, they didn't want a delivery partner inserted between them and their, their client because they used to working with those client relationships. So we had to 
spend a lot of time in the early 18, first 18 months working to break down barriers, bringing that trust and collaboration together such that we could all succeed. With the trade unions, the one thing we didn't want was a major project agreement, um, which had been used at um, T5. And there was a number of reasons we didn't want that. It's a, because we thought there was already existing frameworks that existed, such as the working rules agreements, etc. And also, we didn't think we had the complexity of T5, particularly around the electrical and mechanical trades. But what we did do, we committed to a memorandum of understanding with the trade unions, um, where all these basic principles would be upheld and delivered. And one of the, the key planks within that memorandum of understanding, and this is where there was a cost impact, was that we said we wanted a directly employed workforce, which was a major shift for most of the tier ones at the time. If, if, again, if you think about the economic market, a lot of self-employed people, and suddenly we are saying, again, using intervention, we are saying to the supply chain, you will use directly employed people. And they didn't take it seriously at first, and even after some of them had been contracted, we used to do our our own audit team, we used to have to go in and say, you're not using directly employed people, you're going to have to change. And straight away you know the answer, they'd come and say, well, that's going to cost you. And we used to go through that um, cycle of saying, well, this is why it's not going to cost. And sometimes we did pay. Now, the other times there was the, we, we also committed at the lower levels to the London living wage. You know, we, we made a commitment to Boris Johnson that we would pay everybody at least the London living wage. So all these things helped to create an environment where the trade unions were satisfied that we would look after people working on the, on the site and create a good environment. And we supplemented that, of course, with best-in-class facilities for the workers who were working on the site. Going on to the site workers, we were very lucky with them because, as Kenna said, the Olympics um, stood up and allowed us to get people engaged. People wanted to be involved with the Olympics. You know, and we, we unashamedly used our communication team to get them involved in the pictures and the campaigns and the posters so they felt a big part of what was going to um, have to be done to put the Olympics on. And they were probably the easiest people to actually get engaged other, other than the other two. And the last thing, just going back to trade unions, we also committed to having a trade union training centre on site as well. So that way we got everybody engaged. Now, one of the things that really made a step change for us was the way we delivered health and safety. Because all the challenges I've just mentioned, we used health and safety to change the culture of what we're trying to do on the Olympic Park from a delivery perspective. Now we're working here in an unregulated environment and anybody, I mean you, you work in a regulated environment, you work with the ONR, we obviously work with the health and safety executive, but our supply chain is so different in the sense that we've got civils, utility contractors, and building contractors who'd got some good examples of health and safety performance and some shocking examples of health and safety performance. And we were trying to bring all those together. And um, we also had a real monkey on our back, and that monkey on the back was there'd never been an Olympic um, program delivered without a fatality. And there'd not even been an Olympic stadium delivered without a fatality. And I'm pleased to say that the 2012 Olympics in London were the first time that a program had ever been done where there were no fatalities. So that, that in itself was a major achievement. And your question before, what was the best thing about the Olympics? And that, that, that's always my stock answer, because it was, you know, because nobody thought it would be done. What this allowed, allowed us to do is we set up a leadership team around health and safety performance. That leadership model involved chief executives working with the chairman of the ODA, the construction director of the ODA, but it flowed down to what we call Shell, which was our safety, health and lead, um, environment leadership team. And we went through a number of iterations to create Shell, but what we, what we said is every one of you who are responsible for one of those 70 tier one projects, you will be part of Shell, and you will all work, we will all work together to create the right health and safety environment for the, for the park. And Shell was probably the most in, um, influential working group um, in terms of delivering not just health and safety, but camaraderie, support for each other in terms of getting the job done. You can see the, the, what we achieved here in terms of health and safety, but the, the other planks other than leadership were we had some very clear standards we wanted from the outset, which, which were enshrined in the contract documents. The standards we wanted were not things that we were going to overlay, but that we wanted the contractors to use what they did anyway, but we were going to assure them. We had a very active engagement model, very active reward and recognition programme, and we also spent a lot of time on assurance. You know, unashamedly, we used assurance where we could, and that assurance was 
we were going to all the contractors to say, we're not going to give you things that we're going to do extra to assure against. We're going to just look at what you say you're going to do as businesses, and we're just going to ask you to do it. And it was so powerful, because they can't argue against it. If it's the process and procedures, you know, sort of, it, I'll quote some of the people who work on your site. You know, we did it with Quilla, we did it with Balfour Beta, we did it with Sir Robert McElpoy. And they got very good at doing what they tell all their clients to do, but very seldom they don't do it. And the last thing was, we used communications as a big plank to deliver health and safety. So staying on the theme of, of alignment and keeping the programme in balance, um, we talked about setting up the programme baseline report, uh, but it was very important to us that we scoped all the individual projects as well as we possibly could so that together they would deliver the, the programme objectives. Um, and someone asked earlier about how did, how did we go about those approvals. Um, we did have to take all of our individual project cases to government beyond a level of delegation, which I think was £20 million. So that was around um, the 70 individual projects we talked about. We had a, a three-step um, approval process for each of the major projects probably fairly standard stuff. The first one was the program initiation, so we had a formal gate supported by relatively lightweight documentation which said this is the project that we want to do and this is the amount of funding we need to get this off the ground and do, do the initial planning work. So that would be um, reviewed and approved solely within the ODA. We would not have to go to government for that. The second stage was the most fundamental stage of flushing out the, um, the requirements and the scope and establishing the affordability for the project. And that took us to a stage called the strategic outline case for the project and at that level, there was enough um, definition around the project to go to the Olympic Board, which is the board I spoke about earlier, chaired by the Minister of, of the Olympics, to say, this is the project as we've conceived. These are the games time um, requirements. These are the legacy benefits that we are, we are proposing. This is the affordability within the overall programme. Um, so that board, chaired by um, the Minister, would, would agree that we could, we could proceed with the project at that time. And then... By that time, we were then funneling down on a much clearer scope. We were able to go out to uh, tender with the projects. Uh, and so by the time we came to the business case approval, the full business case approval, that would, be, would have been backed up by um, supplier quotations uh, and design. So we had a reasonable degree of certainty at the time um, before we went to the business case. And uh, it was very fundamental to the ODA that we had that really good understanding and that compatibility between the, the deliverability and the funding and the programme before we went through a business case and, more importantly, before we committed any, any contracts. In terms of actually getting the funding approved, um, government had set up a, a, a unique um, body for us called the Olympic Projects Review Group, which was chaired by our, our um, sponsoring department um, and within the government Olympic executive. And the boards were attended by all the funding government departments, including the Treasury and the Lottery Fund and so on. So we had to go and present our case to them and, and then we'd have been granted the funding. I think that takes us to the, um, the third delivery strategy, which is one of programme management. In terms of what we were trying to do with the delivery partner, our fundamental was that we wanted to make sure everybody succeeded. All the contractors, we wanted to see finish on time, earn the bonuses that Graham and Mark have talked about, have a good accident frequency rate, deliver the priority things, that's what we wanted to see. It wasn't always that straightforward, so things that I'd like to stress that we did and encourage you to do as well are, you know, don't be afraid to make interventions, and I'll describe a couple of those in a second. Don't be afraid to make changes, um, because... As part of supporting people, change is sometimes a necessity and interventions are. So a couple of examples of um, how we supported people. We had um, a young tier one company come working for us, who were very ambitious, um, but they really struggled to manage their tier two supply chain. And we, we worked alongside them and, and got them to introduce different ways of meeting and relying on um, what they could get from their tier twos and help them um, sort of bring the tier twos more into the programme. And some of those things that we did with them, they've now taken on to other projects. So that was a, a good example of we worked with the Tier 2s. We also weren't afraid to make an intervention when one of our um, Option C contracts was not going the way we wanted it to. So on the Velodrome, for example, it was set up as a classic um, um, Option C contract with a, a paying gain share. Our contractor, though, wasn't prepared to take the risk um, within that contract without giving us um, a headache in terms of how much they wanted to take the risk. So our intervention there was, we said, well, that's fine. We're not going to have the pay and gain share mechanism anymore. We'll manage the risk. Um, but in, in return, we'll offer you some time-related milestones. Um, but we will um, also want to add more um, clarity and transparency and to help you choose your tier twos. So, you know, we, we did some of these interventions um, 
that the, the term you've actually been asking about. And we had to do that just to make sure these projects succeeded. That particular project, though, worked very well. We worked with the contractor, so we met his time related milestones. We managed the risk, and the £20 million pounds that that contractor wanted to, um, what, what, as they saw the risk, we managed back within the um, budget that we'd actually got approved by the OPRG that Kelly just mentioned. So, you know, don't be afraid as clients to sometimes manage risk because, you know, you're probably better, best suited, better suited sometimes than contractors are. You can also look at this slide to see that in doing so, around governance, we all wanted to have our clear roles and responsibilities, and that applied with the contractors as well. They were good at certain things, and it was important for us as delivery partners, even though we've got an organisation with us like Lango Rogue, that we weren't trying to be contractors. Our role was very different. The last thing we wanted to do was be the contractor. Zoe talked a lot this morning about um, integration. I'm not going to try and talk about the tools and the processes of integration. I just want you to sort of visualise the, the scene and the site. We had something like Athletes Village and the park together, something like 500 hectares, and we had a, a boundary of 17 kilometres. We were also on the site dealing with waterways and railways that crisscross that site. And just to make things interesting, we decided we were going to put two tunnels under the, the site of the new aquatic centre. But we'd also um, decided we were going to keep all the um, contaminated material on site because it would help us with our sustainability targets and also reduce costs in terms of landfill tax. Um, so what we ended up doing there, we were trying to put utilities in the ground, we were trying to build infrastructure, we were trying to um, build venues all at the same time and at the same time we were still doing the muck shift as we were finishing some of the venues. So integration, is, I think I'm trying to explain here, became key to everything we did. We, we had a very simple analogy. The, the venues were the meatballs and everything else that we run around on, like the straight wires, were the spaghetti. And that became the spaghetti and meat, uh, meatballs um, analogy that's been used in lots of these presentations. But what it meant is we had to have lots and lots of trackers um, to support integration. We had to have a, a very clear escalation process in, in there. So everything our green trackers was fine, they were managed by the project teams. We had amber trackers that were managed by um, sort of the heads of department. But every week, myself and colleagues, we would sit down and manage the um, integration tracker, those red issues, for the, on behalf of the whole programme. It would upset a lot of people because you made decisions that weren't always a benefit for projects, but you did it for the benefit of the programme. And what that meant is eventually we were delivering things like the velodrome, the first um, project to be delivered on site, and we were on temporary water, we were on temporary um, telecoms, we were on uh, temporary everything, but the, we, we, we had to get that done for the programme, not because we needed the the velodrome that, that day, we needed it more to demonstrate to the public and to the IOC that the Olympics would be ready on time. You know, it wasn't a contractual commitment, this was a confidence building commitment. So hopefully that gives you some idea of some of the things we had to do around the integrated planning programme and why we had to do it. We were very effective in that, we kept 2 million cubic metres of soil on site, um, all washed and reused, um, we, we managed to deliver all our projects on time, um, we had some um, projects where there was lots of change. So going back to the commercial example, we let one particular um, infrastructure contract at just under 20 million. We let it for 20, it finally came to under 20. You might say well, you got something horribly wrong there, Jason, you, you, you really messed that one up. But we, that was really a build and design contract in the sense that we had to do it that way to keep everything else going. But we still managed to get it closed. We managed it through the compensation events and the early warnings. We added lots of new scope to it and we still had a successful outcome. So that's really where the um, NEC contract paid dividends for us. If we can now talk about logistics, this has often been likened to the biggest logistics operation since the Second World War in terms of what had to be put in place for the Olympics. You can see just reading down the items here that you know we had a lot to build. We were dealing with lots of things other than just our work. So you've got network rail, you've got British waterways. Right at the beginning we had to think about our strategy. Was it something the client was going to deliver as the overall contractor for logistics? Would we do it through a number of contracts? or would we let the supply chain try and manage it? It was made more difficult in the sense that from a principal contractor point of view, we'd said that we, as uh, CLM, the ODA, we didn't want to be a principal contractor for the whole site, and we wanted each individual contractor to be the principal contractor for their individual site. In the end, we came up with a strategy that said that CLM would act as the logistics contractor um, on behalf of the ODA. And what that meant is that we had to then put in place, um, first of all, a business case, and we had to get that business case approved and we had to support that business case with lots of strategies to say why it was necessary 
you know, some simple examples of congestion in the east end of London, making sure that that continued to flow, making sure we got our vehicle movements correct, making sure we dealt with delivery management, etc., etc. Once we've got our strategy signed off, we then had to implement this through a number of contracted services. We had a team of probably 30 people who worked with um, a supply chain that delivered everything from temporary buildings through to temporary roads, logistics and off-site logistics centres, goodness knows what else. In the process of the time, what was the logistics contract became the park operations contracts and we worked with these supply chain members to take them from providing temporary facilities to then providing facilities management during the Olympic Games as well. And that's something we never really thought we'd do at the outset. It's something we had to do as we flexed as we went through. And I think Ken had made, you know, it was one of those things that worked tremendously well. We, we did have the advent of the test events to help us, so we tested all these things out. But we had an incident management regime in place for the Olympic um, programme. And it got to the stage where we used to cancel the calls because we just had no, nothing to deal with. Um, so that, that in itself proved that we've been successful. And as well as the contracted services, there were lots of things we had to do um, through a non-contracted regime. We said that we didn't want car parking on site. We, we wanted to make sure that people came to site and they, were, they moved around the site on buses and things like that. So we had to make sure that the, some of the non-contracted aspects still worked as well. We still had to make access available for statutory services. We still had to accommodate up to 70,000 visitors who had a genuine interest and wanted to come and see our site. And all this just put more and more pressure on this logistics team and more and more de de and delivery aspects to deal with. So just a few words about our fourth um, strategy now. I think you've already heard a lot about um, program project controls to realise that that was very, very important to us in terms of delivery. So I just want to pick up a couple of additional points here. First one was around um, managing the baseline. At a detailed level, you've heard how we use change control to manage the baseline. But at a total um, program level, um, both as a communication tool to stakeholders, but also for ourselves to get a view of the total program scope as it developed. Uh, beyond that yellow book, about two years in, when the projects were becoming more mature, uh, we did a, a total rebaselining exercise and we republished effectively the yellow book. We restated our scope, our program, our, our risk, our budget uh, in the blue book, which then became the new sort of program bible as this is, this is now our scope. So this wasn't um, new news. We weren't seeking approvals with us. This was capturing all the changes that had gone on through the course of the program to restate the baseline in a, in a single document that described the entire program. The pink book was a little different. It was decided that the ODA were not the best placed um, body to deliver the transformation, the physical transformation that would be required to the venues after the games. It would be more appropriate for the um, London Legacy Development Corporation to do that as part of their overall responsibility. So the pink book effectively carved out the scope, which was the post-games work, um, packaged that up neatly so that we could transfer that scope through government to another public body. Body. The orange book um, was our games time scope. As we got very close to games, it became absolutely critical that we understood the scope that we had yet to deliver, particularly as by that stage, LOCOG were very, very active and suddenly had lots of people who knew exactly what they wanted, which is what we'd wanted four years previously but couldn't get. So the orange book defined all of our, our games time scope. Um, and the black book, um, which is, I think, the phase that we're still in, is the, the, the final post games. There, there is some scope that the ODA has to do on the off park venues primarily post games so that was how we managed the baseline and again this wasn't a, a detailed management tool this was a communication tool and again a bit of a confidence building both internally and externally that we really understood the full scope of the program the other bit I wanted to talk about was um, assurance in an earlier slide I think it said we had a fairly heavyweight assurance regime um, part of our strategy for allowing the delivery partner to deliver was to provide heavyweight assurance within the ODA and upwards and outwards to, um, to government and the National Audit Office. So we um, decided very early on we needed a, a robust um, framework of assurance and we put in what is called the three lines of defence model that some of you may have heard about when talking about assurance models. The concept is that an organisation to be robust needs three lines of defence. The first line for the ODA was our project sponsors. So we had a, an ODA client side sponsor for each of the construction projects. So they are at a day-to-day -day level involved in the project, so they can't provide truly independent assurance, but they do understand a lot of what's going on on the project, and they are able to work with the delivery partner who is 
in its turn working with the um, contractors to provide the first level of assurance. So, you know, is the project that is being conceived and delivered, is it still in line with the brief that we have signed off? Is it still in line with the business case? The second line of assurance um, was called the programme assurance uh, functions. They were both a, a dedicated programme assurance office, but also assurance functions within areas like um, commercial, finance, um, quality, our external technical reviewers. Um, they were the second line of defence. And then the third line of defence in this model is the internal audit function, um, completely independent reporting um, to the board, uh, in our case staffed by an external function. So that, that audit function provides the third line of defence. And those three lines worked in concert to make sure that we had as an objective a picture as possible of performance, that we could both use ourselves for decision making, but also to assure the outside world that things were under control. Just a word or two about the second line of defence. Um, it sat between the executive and the delivery partner and it provided the executive with decision making information, um, trends, performance analysis. Um, it was the custodian of the programme governance, so that when I talked earlier about the governance being reviewed and changed frequently and the programme assurance office was responsible for that. It was quite a hands-on function so it looked to work with the delivery partner to um, identify process gaps and of course as we were inventing this from scratch there were a number of process gaps in the early days so we worked together to identify those and then to actually fix them put put that in place and we managed all of the external assurance all those bodies I spoke about that wanted to come and um, review us we, we tried to manage all that I think Gordon used this slide um, earlier to demonstrate the modular approach that we had to project reporting, trying to source data at the lowest level possible and then use that same data in a, in a suite of modular reports so that we didn't have layers of groups writing their own report with their own interpretation of the data. The data should speak for itself with just a very thin level of commentary on top of it. And in the same way as that, on the, in the assurance reviews, starting at the top there from um, Parliament level, um, the National Audit Office conducted its um, annual value for money reviews on us. Um, but we tried to support that with the assurance, as I've said, that was already being done at the lower levels. Although I think individual projects would still feel that there was too much assurance and you know, too many checkers relative to doers, um, I think in terms of the um, political necessity to, to, that, the, that this was going to happen to us and managing it effectively, it was quite a successful strategy. Our last delivery strategy, and I've mentioned it a few times, is, is that of um, transparency. And I think the only point I want to add here, you know, I've said we, we try to use this in our favour. We try to allow as many people as possible access to the park. And obviously that was, during the construction phase, that was difficult because this was a construction site. But we did run bus tours through the park and we invited media in and particularly local residents who had to put up with a lot of inconvenience during the construction period. So um, all the way through really up until just a very few months before the games, we were able to run um, bus tours and you know, provide information to local residents. And we also had webcams on the park so people could see progress for themselves. And we published... Um, a quarterly report which was in the um, public domain so that again our progress was was visible we weren't trying to hide anything okay then so um, we're just going to take you through sort of the, the outcome of all the things that we've mentioned today first of all I'd like you to, to look at this I mean this is the um, the site just before the games but to also remember that the Olympics wasn't just about um, putting on a sporting event it was a regeneration project first and foremost and what you can see here is as well as the the venues for the games you've got the um, um, major investment there from Westfield in a one and a half billion pound new shopping centre which you know that in itself is a success how, how do you suddenly have a, somewhere like Stratford that's outperforming the west end of London you know I mean that, that in itself is a, a major success and it just shows the, the powerful nature of regeneration our task now is obviously to keep delivering the rest of the transformation um, projects Zoe um, was complaining earlier about being involved in the landscape scheme, but you know I, I think the landscape for the, the park was probably one of the best venues in its own right. You know, lots of people used it during um, August and September, and it's, it will be a testament to um, and something we can all use um, as we visit London in the future. This is quite an interesting one. You know, this this um, photograph demonstrates points about integration because not only does it show the ODA scope of works. Um, it shows ODA scopes of works that were contracted and managed by CLM. You've got public art in there that was a contract that was managed by the ODA. And you've got the um, showcase at the, at the forefront of the picture, a sponsor showcase, which was delivered by LOCOG. And we shouldn't forget that after we'd finished, LOCOG put um, £500 million of overlay onto the, the Olympic Park. 
either directly or through their sponsors, which again um, it created another level of integration um, that needed to be managed. Let me just touch on a couple of the priority themes, one of which was sustainability. You, you can read some of those things yourself. One of the things that we, we did fail on, we, we always intended to have a wind turbine on the park for lots of reasons, both commercial and technical. We, 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 we failed on that objective, um, so we had to make it up in other places. We're all reading a lot in the papers these days about the, the, food, the food chain and um, where our food's coming from. I mean, we had a similar issue with um, timber. We, we give a commitment to make sure all our timber came from sustainable sources. Um, but when you try to deal with the um, single sole trader track designer who's used to buying his, uh, just going up to Siberia and picking some trees and he then just says, I'll see the timber in London, it becomes quite complicated then to make um, one person um, understand why we want sustainable to timber and why we want a chain of custody. So it wasn't always easy, this. It, um, it, it had its challenging moments just to deliver some of these priority themes. I've talked about health and safety achievements um, and what we did, but we were also recognised quite widely by lots of outside organisations, including ROSPA and the British Safety Council. And a lot of what has been achieved in health and safety is captured on the Learning Legacy website, and it's also now being used by the supply chain and other projects. One of the things I think we did extremely well, which has not really been um, picked up on by lots of commentators, is the fact that the, the UK benefited not just in London, but all over um, places like, you know, as far as Northern Ireland, Scotland, a lot of people in, in Wales, the, the, the northeast of England. And um, that was no small part due to people like Sir John Armit getting out with his roadshows with our communication teams, all in briefing days in all parts of the country to make sure that suppliers could get, get involved in the Olympic Games. And you, you can see the stats there that um, show what we did. In terms of the apprentices, again, that was another intervention. You know, we, we set our targets at the beginning and then we said, we can do better than this and we kept raising the targets in terms of apprentices. Our challenge now is to make sure those kind of targets go into other public sector contracts, so we don't just keep doing this as one-off programmes, we keep trying to make sure this continues from um, programme to programme. But it does demonstrate what we can do, um, achieve as a um, UK supply chain and PLC when we want to. Coming back to the hard numbers, we delivered back to um, Treasury, the best part of um, a billion pounds. Some of that was reinvested back in the Olympics. Some of it's um, gone back into the public coffers. We did that through a number of means. Um, some things were as simple as challenging the ODA, challenging local to say, can we keep take a, a permanent venue off the site and can we um, use one of the existing facilities in London? Other things were just good value uh, management and value engineering on a project by project level. And some of it was also taking going back to continue, so take it, knowing to take some of those risks from the projects up into the programme level and managing it up at the programme. So Kenna and I are, are often ask about differentiators and um, why we were successful. And one of the thoughts I'd like to leave you with is that um, we weren't innovators. You know, we, we weren't doing lots of R&D and tr trying to come up with things that hadn't been done before. Lots of things we did were t t t time and tested, um, but maybe we were just a little bit more belligerent and disciplined in terms of how we executed them. It also helps us with our success that, you know, within the components of the client and the delivery partner, we had very, very experienced people. We could all play to our strengths and roles, the roles and responsibilities were well defined. In terms of people, we committed very early to the fact that there would be organisational changes when we went through the programme and we had a full-time dedicated person that did nothing else but work with ourselves and the supply chain to make sure we had effective, high-performing teams. It sounds easy that, and it sounds a little bit, to a, you know, a bit like um, management speak. But you know, Caroline worked with us to make sure that you know, when you know, say I finished what I was good at, we, you you were moved on. You, you know, you hadn't failed, but then the other people who came along behind you to do the follow-on things that were better than you. It's, you shouldn't be ashamed by that. But I think it's more about recognising that organisations need to flex to be successful. I've talked about um, the clients and our engagement there, but you know, lots of trust and collaboration, lots of transparency. And it all went together to make this high-performance culture. And you, you know, we were very lucky, weren't we, in the sense that um, some of the ingredients I've mentioned today and others have mentioned that we, some people would say it was a perfect storm. But perfect storm or not, we still had to work hard to make it happen. And that's what we're all, we, we all committed to. So, in summary then, no single bullet. We did have that vision and that ambition. 
which was came from <coughs> Singapore when we were told that London was going to host the games. We'd need to carry that forward now into transformation into legacy, so it's a 25-year programme. We, we realised right from the beginning we, we had to do this as a collective team. We couldn't do it on our own, so lo- lots of support and um, looking out for each other. Lots of interventions. Don't be afraid to escalate. That was one of our real key learnings, you know, escalate when you need to, don't, don't wait, don't wait to be told, don't try and think you can do all these things on your own, set realistic targets, it's better to incentivise people than penalise people. So those are, that's a flavour of what we thought were key learnings, and a lot of that now is captured on our legacy, uh, my learning legacy website, which I think you may want to talk about, Kenna. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just mention that um, briefly. Um, some of you may already be aware of this, but uh, about... Um, Two years before the end of the programme, so when we were very much in full delivery flow, uh, partly as as a result of a National Audit Office report which um, asked the question really about what could be done to ensure that the learnings were going to be captured for future projects, we set up, we as the ODA set up a formal um, learning legacy project um, with just a one person, a project manager, whose objective was to capture uh, all of the learning that had gone on um, during the the development of the programme. And we invited, we partnered up with um, universities and um, institutions, specialist institutions, and we basically invited them in to come and do research on us. And they were, of course, delighted because they very rarely get um, access to you know, live programmes while they're actually running. And we facilitated them to interview uh, many of the senior people um, in the ODA and CLM and of the supply chain and to gather data. And all that has been documented in a whole number of um, research papers that are available to everyone on the Learning Legacy website, which you'll find under the uh, OGA. Uh, under the Cabinet Office MPA umbrella somewhere on in the internet. Um, and there are also there a lot of tools and templates and reporting techniques and you know, general information that we thought was useful, stuff that we had to develop from scratch when we started. And we sort of said, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually invent a quango in a box so that if, you have a, if we set up something else tomorrow and you need, to, you need to do all this lot again, all these things are already there. And you might need to adapt them, of course, but you'd have a good, pretty good start. So, so that's uh, my plug for the Learning Legacy uh, website. Just to finish off then, um, we delivered what we think, of course, was a very successful game. We believe we've provided a great platform for for the legacy. And the Olympic Park, which has been closed since the Games, um, reopens um, this summer. I think a big pop concert has just been announced. That's right, yes. So um, Live Nation are going to be the operator for the next um, 18 months. and They're going to be putting on a series of concerts. We're we're working through a programme now of £400 million of transformation. And then we just got West Ham signed up as um, the preferred bidder for the Olympic Stadium. And just to complicate matters, Boris Johnson's just said to us recently, uh, as well as trying to get that ready for 2016 football season, can you accommodate the Rugby World Cup in 2015 as well? So um, these, these, challenges ne- these challenges never go away. <laughs> It's been, and been very gratifying to all of us who were lucky enough to work on the project that, of course, it wasn't just us who felt it went well. The world's media has been pretty complimentary as well, and it's been great to see uh, the construction industry and the UK getting some public press for a change for, for project delivery. You know, it's given much greater confidence that you know, we can deliver major projects successfully. And I think that takes us to the end of our session, so thank you very much. We're happy to take questions of any aspects. <laughs>